five months job. This is the quickie, and it could be made bigger or smaller, and the one that I made was made a lot quicker because we didn't cut grooves and we, you know, didn't put in uh, C is, as I is, whatever, mm -hmm. tomatoes and tomatoes. Uh, so you can build one quickly. But now that we've got this one here illustrated with this, I want to show you real quick a benefit and a de-benefit or unbenefit of the composite bowl. This is a composite bowl. It's got a wooden core. It's got seven pieces of antler on the belly of the compression so you can have them just butt up and meet each other. And the back is sinew, so it is a, a composite bow, but it doesn't shoot as well as a wooden bow of the same weight because there's more mass to this bow. This bow weighs more. You put it in water, it's going to sink where a wooden bow would float. This is going to shoot less well than a wooden bow, everything else being equal, because when this was built, it did, wasn't built with a reflex. It was just thrown together. Jeff built this, what, two years ago, three years ago? Mm -hmm. First one. Uh, and he just slapped it together, and it's straight. Well, we can bend this tremendously. Yeah, it you know, it's like a huge, strain. huge, huge rubber band. But the problem is, like, I don't know of anybody whose arms are long enough to take full advantage of all the stresses that you can apply to this. It should have been built with a reflex. This little bow can easily shoot a 30-inch arrow if you can pull it that far. And it certainly is in no danger of failing, even though it was very crudely put together, very crudely glued. It was glued by heating it over a kitchen stove, in fact. But uh, it's made all the wrong way. It's straight. It has no reflex. Now, this bow that John is building is a virtually identical design. However, it has a tremendous reflex in it. And it's probably going to outshoot this bow hands down. Of course it will. Okay, uh, I think hopefully you've got a concept of why and what of a con uh, composite bow. Uh, now we're going to put Jeff to work and we'll put them together so that you can see how to do it. Jeff, what are we up to? Well. I'm trimming up a piece of wood. It's got a real nice natural curvature to it in the grain. It's a chunk of Osage. It's got a real beautiful flow of grain. It's a gorgeous piece of wood. Curvature is pretty big. This is going to become two ears, or probably four ears, for, for two bows. It's the section that we've been calling the Sia. And what I'm doing is trying to trim up the edges so that they're square. So I have a piece that's going to be easy to split. My plan is to split this way so I can get two batches of ears out and then to split along here and to utilize this section in here, this highly curved section, to make the ears of the bow. And I'm doing it in such a way that the edges of the growth rings are going to be exposed. So we're going to get a really beautiful piece, real nice piece of wood, real nice coloration, nice grain flow for the ear. And trimming it up with uh, just you can use an axe, you can use a, a cleaver like this, a machete, anything you're comfortable with working with. This has a nice heft to it, it's easy to control. It's a very hard piece of wood. That's what I'm up to. Okay, this is where we're at. The split gave me a piece, real flat. Should be easy enough to split. My plan is to split along here like this, so I get two sections that I can use for ears of identical curvature. So I'm going to need to split it along here. So what I'm going to do is again use hand tools, but I'm going to put a couple of cuts in here to kind of guide things along. I'm going to put a cut here. I'm going to put a cut here, they try to put a little one in there, and hopefully the split will follow those cuts because there will be lines of weakness.
What you got, buddy? Two ears. Perfect. Okay, you can see the growth rings on this stave. What we're going to do is split this along the growth rings. You can see how nice and flat they are. This is the sort of thing that you want, flat growth rings. You can see down the length when you were able to look at it before, that they're nice and parallel, nice and straight. Now this is a piece of black locust. John already split a stave off of one side, this side, and he used it to make himself a composite bow. And we're going to get greedy and try to get two more staves out of this by splitting it. Now the split might not follow the growth rings perfectly, it might go in and out a little bit. But we don't really care about that because if we goof up, we're still going to get at least one stave out of this. So that's the plan. Try to split this lengthwise along the growth rings. Now you see, we're going to try to split this exactly in half. And you can see there's a large tree, so we have flat growth rings, which will make great for retaining one growth ring for the entire length. Well, she seems to be starting pretty easy. We'll just see what happens. Okay, the splitting wasn't exactly successful, but we got one fine board out of this with a little bit of natural reflex in it. It's got a slight propeller twist, which we could get out by twisting it in the other direction after steaming, once we thin it down to the right thickness. But this is really the sort of thing we're after, a stave like this, that can be worked down with a plane or a draw knife or a scraper, spoke shave, whatever you want to work it down with. You can run it through your milling machine if you want to. But uh, this is the sort of thing that you're after. A nice stave, flat growth rings, flat surface for gluing the sinew onto. About four feet long, one and a half inches wide to start out with. You eventually narrow it down to whatever you want. And now you begin to work this thing down to a final thickness of about 3 sixteenths to a final absolute thickness of 1 eighth of an inch after it's been glued to the horn. But you target about 3 sixteenths uh, just to keep a little bit of extra thickness on there so that you have more to work with as you take the thing down into final shape. Okay, Jeff, now we've seen the raw materials for the ears, the core. We'll cover sinew and glue in a bit as we go. But one of the biggest things we're going to be concerned about here is horn. Why don't you tell us? I see you got a piece of buffalo horn there. Explain something here, what we're doing. Yeah, this piece really illustrates exactly what you want optimally uh, as far as horn is concerned for making a bow like this. This is a, is a horn that's relatively short, but it does not have any twist in it. And that's the most important feature, no twist. Now this surface is the outside curve. And this is the inside curve. This has been taken out so it can be used as a spoon. But it's the outside curve that's going to be uh, probably the best piece of horn because it's the longest. It's slightly concave on its inner surface, and that's good. And it has the right curvature to be placed on the belly of the bow. It wouldn't have to be inverted to be placed on the belly. Why don't you pick up that piece of uh, water buffalo horn to show comparison in size because that's uh, what we're working with inside. Okay, on the other hand, this is this is a strip of Asian water buffalo. This is the inside curve. This would have gone along the surface of the horn like this. You can see it's much larger, a little blacker, a little finer grained, much more expensive, and uh, it has a little bit of a propeller twist to it. So a piece like this would have to be flattened, straightened out, and that twist would have to be taken out of it. Now how are we going to do this? Steam. Boil it and steam it. Moist heat. Moist heat is important. Yeah. But you say that also you've cautioned me on uh, over boiling it and weakening it. Yeah, you don't want to overcook these things. So they will burn and uh, if, you, if you get them soaked with water it may crack when it dries on you. So the idea is not to overcook it. Just steam it or boil it for a few minutes to make it plastic and then bend it. If you need to straighten out a piece like this, if you'd like to get that propeller twist out, you steam the middle section, and then you grab it in your hands like this, and you twist in the opposite direction. You see now it's twisted right. in color, now it's straight. And then once it's been heated up and you do this, 
you dip it in cold water in the middle and that will set the curvature. That will cool it down fast and it will stay in the new position. Well, my experience with working with horn and antler both was it didn't take very much time at all. Like you said just minutes. A couple minutes. And I know that when I worked with that antler bow, yeah, I probably overdid it in 15 or 20 minutes. I could almost tie knots in it. Yeah, antler is a slightly different material, slightly tougher to work with. It's a little more brittle. And if you overcook antler, it's shot because uh, antler consists of a bony core, bony matrix, and a protein content uh, that's inside of the uh, little cavities in the matrix. And if you boil that for too long, you're going to cook the protein, denature the protein, leach it right out, and you're going to be left with something that's not going to be as flexible as if you had barely cooked it or steamed it only slightly. And again, it's minutes. It only takes a few minutes to get this into a plastic state. So don't overdo it. Well, let's stay on the horn then. Uh, but we might just well let everybody know that, you know, antler works, elk antler, even deer antler, I'm sure we'd work in short segments. I've heard of American Indians making bows out of all those materials. And then uh, ribs, bones. Bones, yeah. There's a, <coughs> a, a lawyer in Slovenia, a young man that's made a couple of bows with uh, horse ribs for belly. Same thing, compression. Sure. Okay, well, let's stay with the horn. We're going to run out of time on this tape. Uh, but horn and antler, we'd let everybody know, is a viable substitute. But let's work with the horn. Okay. And you've got those uh, Kemsbach horn. Yeah, this is imported <coughs> by knife makers and knife makers uh, warehouses into this country. And it's used to make handles. It's a long, straight horn. It's an antelope horn. Very plastic, very long grain, readily available. There are dozens of companies in the country that import this stuff. And the nice thing about it is that there's very little waste involved in using one of these to make a bow. You can split it lengthwise and then steam it very gently and clamp this surface, the bottom surface, to a flat metal plate and apply C-clamps on the other side and flatten these out almost completely. And it, you look at that curvature and you think that uh, it doesn't sound very likely that you'd be able to do that. But in fact, it's a lot easier than it sounds. And this is the result. These are some that I had worked down that way. And they are very nearly perfectly flat. Now you might notice if you look at these closely, or if you do this at home, you might find that some very small cracks are going to open up on the belly. Well, these aren't very important. They're going to fill in with glue. They are longitudinal cracks. The bow will not have any stress in that direction, so it's not going to hurt things at all. So you should keep in mind that this is a nice source of material for you to use. Of course, you can go to any leather shop and buy a pair of cow horns. And as long as they're not twisted up, you saw that outside curve in the cow horn. And that's probably the most readily available material that we have in this country for making bows like this. Now you also you using like uh and everything else, you just use a handsaw, hacksaw, yeah, for can just use about a everything. Yeah, if you like. You can use any tool that you like to cut this out, but I always prefer to do things by hand because you have more control. You go slower, but again, you're going to be spending months making a bow like this, so why rush? What I would do is just mark on here the piece that I'd like to remove, make it a little bit wider on the horn than what you really want because you never know. You might want that extra width later on. And I take off that outside curve, like this. And now what I would do is clamp this into a workbench somewhere. You might need to touch this up a little bit, make sure that you're taking out nice parallel cuts on opposing sides of the horn. Clamp this into a workbench and start cutting at either end. I usually start cutting at this end because the horn is solid here and I don't like to be tired out and working on tough material at the end of the sawing, so I start the thick end. I would cut the tip off and start sawing in this way and follow the grain, go very slowly, and eventually you're going to get to this point and you're not going to be able to saw any further, so you take that blade out of, the, out of the saw, you turn it at right angles so that you can saw this way, down the length of the, of the horn. Go nice and slow, make nice even cuts, take your time, and you won't find this very difficult. If it's a long horn, it might take you a few hours. But so what? 
I mean, if you're going to build a bow like this, presumably you're willing to spend the time on it to begin with to 